Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rashkar, and uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, all your support and uh, the presence. Um, actually, Dr. al and uh, Dr. Uh, Yarmaz had made my, uh, uh, my talk much easier uh, because they give a very good introduction about the evidence. Um, now I'm going to talk about the gap, although it's titled Evidence practice gap in your, in, in, your, in your program, I also like to use the word lost in the translation because we have a problem translating these um, gu guidelines and uh, studies into actual practice. So um, just um, a short reminder, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to belabor a lot about it, but if you can, if you, if you remember, we already know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are class one with level of evidence A, the highest level of evidence, in patients with uh, HEF, uh, REF, with reduced ejection fraction, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. And then the addition of other medications um, like diuretics just for, for uh, relief of uh, congestion, the addition of uh, hydralazine nitrates with a class one level of evidence A, also especially in African Americans who are symptomatic, and the addition of mineralocorticoid antagonists or aldosterone antagonists in patients with persistent uh, symptoms. So ACE inhibitors, as, I, as, as we all said, is strength of evidence A, the highest level, and should be titrated. This has been mentioned in several guidelines, titrated to doses in, in as tolerated to the highest doses in the trials, and we all recall the titrated or the target doses of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers um, that we should be targeting, and I'll show you what we are actually doing. Um, again, the individual ARBs, and, and uh, I'd like to always stress on this word individual, because we do have evidence of mainly of two ARBs in uh, heart failure, the Vasartan and Candisartan, and unfortunately, we still in practice lose, use other ARBs with no evidence in heart failure. They have a level of strength of evidence A, post-MI heart failure, especially with Valsartan, and uh, strength of evidence B with chronic heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. These, these are reasonable to reduce morbidity and mortality as alternatives to ACE inhibitors or as first-line therapy, um, especially if patients are already taking ARBs for hypertension or for any other reason. Or a class 2B as an addition of ARB, although recently this has been put into caution because of the uh, worsening kidney or potassium, but it can, it can still be used and mentioned the ACCAHA uh, 2013 guidelines. And we know from several trials, even from the 90s, in the solved prevention and solved treatment, that if you use the best evidence you have if you use both beta blockers and ACE inhibitors compared to either using one of them or uh, neither, whether it's in the prevention or in the treatment. So the combination of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers is recommended as routine therapy for patients with reduced ejection fraction. And for patients with a recent decompensation of heart failure after optimization of volume status and successful discontinuation of intravenous diuretics and vasoactive agents. Whenever possible, again, therapy should be initiated in the hospital setting at a low dose prior to discharge in stable patients and then up titrated as, as tolerated in an outpatient setting. Um, you've seen this slide uh, again several times probably today, the paradigm which has shown um, the, uh, the significant improvement in outcomes compared to the ACE inhibitors. So now we have new evidence on top of the previous evidence of ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and ARBs of a new uh, class, the ARNI, showing, um, showing a significant improvement. So it, uh, it's not yet in the guidelines, but again, if it has the inclusion criteria of the paradigm, it has to be now considered standard of care. Okay, so how are, we, how are we doing? How are we practicing this evidence? The, um, the uh, EuroHF and improvement uh, registries, which looked uh, at the practice, they found that ACE inhibitors were only used in about 60% uh, 
beta blockers in about 36, 34 percent, spironolactone in about 20, 12 percent. This was in 2006. Some would say, well, the evidence wasn't strong yet, although there was very strong evidence from the 80s and 90s about ACE inhibitors uh, and, and beta blockers. And um, fortunately, we uh, uh, cardiologists had better use, a little better use than the general internist um, in uh, using ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, maybe because we are more focused on uh, the cardiac and heart failure. That if you look at the actual prescription, and, I, and I'm just reminding you that it's not enough to keep a patient on a, on a drug and say that I'm using it if it's on tiny doses of whatever ACE inhibitor or beta blocker. It has to be on the target doses. Look at those who had 50% um, uh, of the uh, recommended dose was the 60% of beta blockers, but only the 100% the of the recommended dose was only about 20% of the patients on the recommended dose. Many of us just start the medication, see the patient doing well, never remember to go up on the target dose. The SHIFT trial, which was focusing on the use of beta blockers and as an alternative or an addition, evabradine, if you remember, the, to target a heart rate. The target here was the heart rate to go down to less than uh, 70. Look at the actual use of beta blockers. It was quite good. It was under, um, uh, under all controlled uh, circumstances but 89%, uh, but at 50% of the target doses was only 50% of the patient, and on to total target doses, quarter of the patients only were on target doses with the clear evidence of the importance of the target doses in that. And, and when we compared our trials, our trials show the, the good use with over time, the Merit HF, Metoprolol and Copernicus, the, uh, uh, close to 70% of the patients were on beta blockers. That is in the trials, but when we wanted to look at the actual practice, when we looked at the registries which describes what is going on in real life, look at how bad we were using beta blockers. Even in, in 2010, less than 20% of the patients were on uh, the treatment. So the Improve HF, which was an initiative um, in, in the U.S. by the American Heart Association to improve the use, to look first at the use of, of uh, the recommended medications and therapies. We know, as you've seen in the, the previous talks about the guidelines, the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, ICDs and CRTs, and education. There was a significant difference between those who died in the, in the follow-up and those who were alive. And the use of these was higher, much higher in those who were alive. And uh, nevertheless, you can, you can see how low it, the, the use was even in those who, um, who were not, who were still alive. So we, we also know, and you've seen from the guidelines, that the steroid antagonists um, being recommended in patient New York Heart Association class 30, uh, class 2 to 4, injection fraction 35 or less uh, to reduce morbidity and mortality. And in following MI in patients who have a left, ejection, a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40 percent who develop symptoms of heart failure or have a history of diabetes mellitus. We, especially in our population, when we looked at our heart registry, heart failure only 30 percent um, 30 or 40%, 40% 40 of the patients who were actually recommended to be um, on uh, adversarial antagonists um, post MI heart failure were on. So we, we, we do have a significant problem. ICD therapies, again, I don't need to go into these details. Dr. Mariam had done a good job in it. ICDs and CRTs have all proven the, uh, to be of benef benefit. But again, look at a, a, a very recent trial. In, in registry in 2013, an Italian registry looked at their practice with all the guidelines being published. ACE inhibitors were only used about 78%, beta blockers 65%, um, digitalis, no strong evidence, adducer antagonists only 55%. And even after a full year of follow up, they're still after the decompensation, they followed up and they were still very defective in using these medications with all the evidence that we have. We looked at our GULF 
registry, more than 5,000 patients in the region, seven countries in the region, and we, had, we were not better. We, we had ACE inhibitors were used in, in about 70% um, and uh, beta blockers when the patients were discharged was, was a little higher than when they were admitted with heart failure, but still lack um, significant use, so we are lacking that. Now, the question that I'm having, and I always ask myself, why is there a gap between evidence and practice? And this is not only in heart failure, this is in, in all our medicine. We have lots of evidence, as we've seen. We have good, very good trials. We control the situation. We get good results. But we have a problem with, 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 with translating it into practice. Something, well, it's probably not specific for medicine, something called domain dependence. We talk a lot about actual practice. We talk a lot about, as we said, as Dr. Fagbo said today, doctors, many of the doctors smoke. They, they instruct their patients not to smoke and they know the evidence that behind smoking, they still smoke. We talk about diet and exercise, none of us dies and exercise. Why is there a domain dependence, meaning that you're very good at, at understanding the thing, at investigating the thing, but when you translate it, who knows Harry Markowitz? This is a, a very famous American economist who won the Nobel Prize in 1990. He, for the portfolio theory, he, he, he put a, a, a huge theory in, in equations and, and how to distribute your money into the best profit, best portfolio for the best outcomes and revenues without, without losing. When he, ha when, he, when he came to invest his money, what did he do? He just divided it 50-50, shares and bonds, and that's it. So where does his whole theory go to? Why does he, he has a full theory of how to distribute your money into, and took a Nobel Prize for it, but he couldn't translate it himself. So we have a, this is, this is human nature. We have a problem in doing that. And, in, and the other question I ask is how to fill the gap. I know you're probably waiting for me to give you the answer. I wish I knew the answer myself. And there, there must be a problem in the actual practice. We are not translating this. We know how to say it. We know how to talk about it. Every one of us memorizes the guidelines probably very well. But when it comes to practice, we have a defect. So what did the improve HF? You remember when I showed you the improve HF that there was a significant uh, uh, low use of these medications and those who were alive were better? They actually followed these patients for 24 months in this initiative, and there was a significant improvement over time in the use of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, uh, anticoagulation, CRT, ICD, and education. What did they do? They used the, the, the tool, uh, toolkits of, of keeping people in, on track, of educating the practitioners into using these therapies. So they used evidence-based algorithm pocket cards in their pockets. Uh, they, they, they distributed the guidelines. They used assessment and management forms and, and checklists, um, education materials, a website for people to, um, to improve on. But this was in the setting of an initiative they, they followed. We have shown, unfortunately, that many of these initiatives, when they, when they stop the follow-up, they stop the control setting, it goes back again. It's, it's, it's like the, the bathtub. You have very high uh, uh, errors, goes down with an initiative and then goes up again, and this is a problem. So the guidelines actually stressed on the importance of quality metrics and performance measures, and it gave it a class one performance measures based on professionally developed clinical practice guidelines should be used with the goals of improving quality of care. And a class 2A participation quality improvement programs and patient registries based on national endorsed uh, clinical practice guideline um, is, is uh, indicated. The quality measurement and accountability have become integral parts of medical practice over the past two decades. And heart failure has been a specific target of quality measurement, improvement, and reporting because of substantial impact on population, morbidity, and mortality. The commonly used Performance measures for heart failure are 
are two, process measures and outcome measures. These, these measures, the process measures, is that every patient, for example, needs an LV ejection fraction assessment. He needs symptoms and activity assessment, symptom management, a patient self-care education, the beta blockers that we talked about, the ACE inhibitors, uh, counseling about ICD, post-discharge appointment. These have to be, you're not asked to memorize them if you like, we all do when you practice, but it has to be put in a checklist that you don't forget. The outcome measures, we look into mortality, we look into readmissions, 30-day uh, uh, risk standardized heart failure readmission rate. So do disease management programs help in this situation? Can we really translate these quality measures in disease management programs? I, I wish it does, everyone says it does, but there's lots of conflicting data about that. Disease management has shown great promise as a means of recognizing a chronic care and optimizing patient outcomes. But the dis term disease management has entered into common use without a shared specific understanding of its meaning. It's easy for us to say disease management program. But what does it mean? Every one of us has a meaning, it's something in his mind to, tra to, to, to translate that. You might, might think of it as a cardiology-led one, someone a nurse-led, a clinical pharmacist, a multidisciplinary team. What am I actually looking for? Is it education? Is it physiotherapy? Is it, is it uh, medications? What, what actually does a disease management program mean? There's multiple definitions of management and a variety of related models exist. They generally share core elements such as risk management and coordination of care, and individual program components are highly variable, and that's a big <laughs> Uh, issue. They, the many studies, each one has his own model, and when we compare, you're just comparing apples to oranges, and you don't get good results out of that. So Disease Management Association of America defines disease management as a system of coordinated healthcare interventions and communications for populations with conditions in which patient self-care efforts are significant. And in simple words, a patient who has a chronic disease where self-care is integral here, the patient has to take care of himself. We as care provider, or care, healthcare givers, uh, uh, providers, we just facilitate the communication with these patients to understand their disease and self-care. Again, the definition is not usually used universally. Disease management has to have, the, certain, the American Heart Association has defined uh, components, very important components, have to have a population, patient population identified. Who are the patients that you want to identify? Do you want to include all heart failure patients? Which heart failure patients? Which ones are the ones with recurrent hospitalization, the ones who are the sicker, the ones who have uh, worsening kidney function? You have to identify your population. And the, the, the recipient uh, of this, who's going to get it? Is, the, is, is it the patient or the caregiver of the patient? The intervention. Many of us just say, I'm going to do a program. What is actually what is the intervention you're going to do? Is it more education? Is it more uh, medication counseling? Is it more follow-up? You have to identify exactly the intervention you're doing. The delivery personnel, again, as I said, it could be the nurse, it could be the cardiologist, it could be the, physio the, the rehab physiotherapist, the clinical pharmacist. I do believe in the, into the multidisciplinary approach where everyone has his role and, and, and gives uh, in the outcome. The method of communication, the intensity and complexity of the intervention, the environment that you're in setting, and the outcome measures. What are you going to actually measure? What is important for you, for this patient, is just to keep him out of hospital, out of ER visits, um, uh, rehospitalization. You have to have a target that you think of. Recommended components of a heart failure manager program, again, comprehensive education is very important. Promotion of self-care. Patients with heart failure have to un understand that they need to take care of themselves. Emphasis on behavioral strategies, vision and follow-up after hospital uh, um, discharge, optimization of medical therapy, increased access to providers, early attention to signs and symptoms, and assistance with social and financial concerns. Um, for, for the sake of time, I just want to tell you, um, you remember last year I showed you this checklist of uh, inpatient and outpatient uh, uh, follow-up to, to, to include these uh, domains that we're looking for, and we actually started implementing that. I have to thank uh, Ahmed Hayajna, our nurse, and Dr. Fakhar Al Ayubi, our clinical pharmacist, in, in helping establishing this program too. And um, I can tell you from pre, uh, from uh, simple. Um, 
early analysis that there was a significant improvement in the use of ACE inhibitors before uh, and after the program. It was 62% in our program, went up to 82% of ACE ARBs, beta blockers from 80 to 95% with establishment of this checklist and program. The length of stay was 12 days down to nine days, although this program starts from the patient's discharge. The readmission within 30 days, um, it was 17% down to 3% 30-day readmission rate um, with, with the initiation of this program. Uh, this, I thank you very much and hope to success for everyone.